Hello everybody, welcome to the Variable Resistance live stream. Uh, it's a little louder in here today, uh, so bear with me. Um, today I just wanted to spend a few minutes talking about some various uh, photography uh, techniques, uh, things that you can use with your iPhone, things um, you can use with a full digital SLR. Um, I have a bunch of things um, that uh, basically little tech gadgets and things that um, can help you out and uh, help you document your projects a little better and um, you know be able to do photography in general better. So um, to start, this is what everybody always wants to be carrying around, but inevitably this is what people end up having with them all the time. So um, what does that mean for um, being able to uh, you know, document your work. If you don't have a camera uh, handy, if you don't have all of the special tools available to do all of that, um, you might not be getting the kind of photos that you want. So I uh, ran into this over the weekend. I was helping my girlfriend uh, try to document some stuff. And we were just, you know, running into kind of like poor light issues, uh, things of that nature. Not really sure, you know, trying to figure out the best ways of um, documenting some stuff that she was working on. And, um, you know, I didn't have my uh, SLR on me. I, you know, wanted to try to do the best I could with what I had, but, uh, you know, you only have so many things. Um, these are becoming, you know, point-and-shoot cameras have been uh, out there forever. There's some good new point-and-shoot cameras that actually have uh, replaceable lenses on the end of them. Those are uh, becoming more and more um, also uh, of value. Uh, another thing that I wanted to throw out as just in terms of different types of cameras you might want to have on hand if you're doing documentation. Um, something that I've found uh, very, very handy to have uh, when doing documentation, especially if you're doing um, installations, if you're doing um, various types of uh, things that take a while. Uh, you might not just want to talk about the end result of the thing. Uh, you know, when it's doing theater installations or doing uh, installations in general, it's nice to be able to talk about how the piece came together, how it got installed, how it got put where it got put, um, all of that. A very handy uh, way to go about doing that is with something like this guy. So you're seeing uh, sort of the live uh, moving around in the space. So this is actually a GoPro camera. I'm going to switch back to my main cam here. Um, this little guy, very little tiny guy. There's actually a new version of this now. This is the Hero. There's the Hero 2. Um, the nice thing about this guy, it doesn't actually have a um, any viewfinder, although you will notice with this guy, um, I have a little backpack on it. Uh, it's actually only, you know, a th uh, two thirds of the side of the of the width of this, but I have a little backpack on it that gives you an extra battery, uh, allows it to last a little longer. Um, as you can see, I'm also coming out of this into HD video um, and able to shoot around in the space. So you can see uh, I have a couple tools that I'm using. I'm using this uh, LED light that I that I built from some uh, LED strips and I'm also using sort, sort of a traditional uh, umbrella uh, light stand, light kit. And you can get these uh, very cheap. This is like 35 bucks at B&H. Uh, very cheap. Comes with a 300 watt bulb. Um, very, very little handy um, kit. 300 watts. You can't beat it. Uh, it's a lot of light. So that is uh, primarily what I wanted to talk about today. And um, I'll get back to the cameras a bit later. Um, the nice thing about the GoPro is that you can shoot video with it. Uh, it holds a lot of uh, video. It shoots HD if you want, so you can get some nice high-quality um, video that you can uh, use for your documentation. It also allows you to do uh, interval photography, and you can just use it as a camera. And it's very, very wide-angle. So if you're in a space and you want to be able to capture a lot, then um, wide angle is really nice. If uh, you know, if, let's say you're in real estate and you want to show an apartment off, uh, you got to have a wide angle lens because otherwise you're going to get like one of the walls of the bedroom, especially if you're in New York City and the bedrooms are tiny. You're not going to get uh, the full, you know, 
look of the space. It's gonna, a uh, wide angle lens is gonna allow you to essentially uh, simulate uh, uh, simulate what a, uh, be able to see more of a space. Sorry. It's gonna, it's gonna, uh, essentially give you, uh, when you, when you see a, um, not a ratio, but a degree rating to a lens, what it's effectively telling you is if you, let's say, have a 90 degree, uh, uh, you know, focal range, then if you make that 90 degree angle with your fingers, right? So I've got a little square or a little, you know, 90 degree angle here. If you turn that, put that up to your eyeball and sort of look at where your fingers are pointing, that's the sort of uh, field of vision that your camera is going to have. So 120 degrees is, you know, considerably more. 170 degrees, which is like an ultra wide angle lens. That's going to get you know a lot more of that space, but it's still going to be compressed down into that same image that you're seeing. So um, makes a big difference. Telephoto lens narrows that way down, allows you to es essentially get um, things that are further away. I'm personally not a telephoto fan, but if you're doing sports photography and things like that, very handy way to um, sort of hone in on the subject. So uh, when doing documentation, I find um, uh, I like wide-angle lens. This is a wide-angle lens here on this camera. Uh, it goes anywhere from 24 to um, 10, uh, which effectively is like 150 degrees to about maybe 100 degrees or 90 degrees. Um, it's very, very wide-angle. It has a little bit of uh, distortion. It has some aberrations that come up when you're really pulled wide so you're gonna get in focus in the middle it's gonna get a little blurry on the outside um, you spend the more money you spend on the lens the less you're gonna have of that uh, and the other nice things you're gonna get like a uh, nice bokeh which is like when things blur out you're gonna get nice little blurry uh, patterns versus just sort of like a, a dull uh, distortion so um, so that's, that's that for cameras. If you're like me and you have an iPhone on you all the time, then you get what the iPhone has. And honestly, I've been wanting to upgrade my, I have an iPhone 4. I kind of want to been up, upgrade to a 4S because it has such a great camera in it for a mobile phone. Um, sort of waiting for the 5, thinking it's only going to get better. Um, so I've been holding off on that. And one of the first things I think I will purchase when I get a 5 is, um, one of these types of lenses, so uh, there's a bunch of different, the Photo Jojo ones I think are sort of the, the most famous ones now, Photo Jojo being um, a pretty big presence out there at this point. Um, and what these lenses uh, allow you to do is essentially adhere a magnet to the phone or to get a case that allows you to connect a little uh, safety shell that also mounts and uh, essentially allows you to mount a lens to the iPhone, which seems a little ridiculous, but then you realize you have the phone on you every day. Um, having a lens that you can attach that is small enough to just throw in your back pocket is kind of handy. Um, there's a bunch of different ones of these out there um, that are magnetically affixed. Um, uh, Digital King also makes some nice ones that, again, magnetic. Uh, kind of, you know, you put this magnetic ring, you adhere it to uh, the surface, and then it allows you to um, effectively, you know, lock a little lens down. Uh, it keeps the light leak uh, to a minimum, and then be able to quickly pull it off. So. Um, yeah, so those are very handy. There's a bunch of different types out there. Um, they're not really all that expensive. Some of them, the Photo Jojo ones, are much more expensive. But you can see from, you know, this is really wide angle. You've got a little bit of uh, uh, a vignette on the outside, right? But um, still, like, really nice way to get a lot of, a lot of content from the, the area. Another thing that's handy, uh, uh, the Glyph. Uh, there's some other versions of these out there really nice way to uh, essentially mount your camera to a tripod uh, or to a, I believe, 3 eighths or 
quarter inch uh, bolt that you can then attach to whatever you want. Um, so that's also very handy. Uh, getting the camera still is very handy. Uh, downloading an app that allows you to have like a three second timer so that you're not actually shaking the camera trying to touch the button when you take a photo is also going to um, help you in that regard. So, um, so uh, that's, that's it for um, lenses, I think. At the end of the day, you, with just the stock lens that's on the camera, even if you have an older iPhone, you can still get some great, um, some great documentation. If you use uh, the tools that you have at your disposal uh, the right way. So I'm gonna actually turn off some of these lights so that I can demonstrate this a little bit. Hopefully this will come through uh, well enough for you here. I might use the GoPro here a little bit too. So as you can see, I've got this really bright light over here um, and I'm actually going to attempt to grab it. Placement, placement of the light is probably the most important thing that you can use at your disposal. So if you can't move the sun, which I don't know of anybody who can, um, then you need to move your subject, right, if you're outside. If you do have control of the light, and actually, I kind of like this. Uh, this is not, this is kind of nice. This is maybe a little bit closer to a three-point lighting scheme that uh, I should maybe try in the future. Uh, just by moving the light a little bit, uh, I was able to darken the background a little bit more, which allows me to pop. You'll see there's a white curtain in the back. If I didn't have the white curtain there and I had a little bit of a darker background uh, as a whole, then uh, I as a subject would really pop here and that could be um, preferable for the shot, right? Uh, one, one of the things that you might notice from this view, and again I might need to go to a different camera here, is that um, with this view I don't, I don't have as much contrast, right? So. My eyes aren't as sunk into my head. Um, you know, you're not seeing the shadows of my nose as much because essentially right now the light is directly behind the camera. Not quite, but if I, if I go over here, for example, rotate my monitor a little bit. So now at this point, I'm really starting to look a lot more flat, right? But if I was to move this light again, Bear with me for a moment and make some clinking noises. If I was to move this way over here to the side, now you're going to see there's a lot more light on this side of my face, right? And, you know, there's some shadows here, there's a lot more depth in the face. Um, of course, if you're documenting yourself, talking or giving a presentation, if you're doing a Kickstarter campaign and you want to do a little video, uh, then this is a perfect example of where you want to light yourself well so that you really uh, appear in the foreground, it, you know, you want the quality to be good. Setting your lights in the right position um, definitely helps. And you'll see I actually have a slightly different color temperature light over here because these are LED lights. And this sort of gives a little bit of a, you now I got a little bit on this side, a little bit on this side. Um, this is a little bit of a bluer light, which I'm still working out whether or not I like that. But since there actually is natural sunlight over here, I'm just attempting to balance that um, with a little bit more of that color temperature. So, uh, and that actually brings to mind, unless you're really trying to accentuate uh, light uh, color temperature differences, um, I would recommend that you stick with one temperature of light. So if you have a lot of sunlight, then if you're trying to use additional light, try to stick with the same color temperature. So use a cooler bulb, like an LED or a um, cool, a cool white. Um, if you're inside, it's nighttime, then try to stay away from those types of LEDs and stick to traditional tungstens if you have those, if that's what are the lights in your apartment. As much as you can, if you can um, isolate the light sources and use them to your advantage, you're going to be able to change the contrast of the space uh, a lot, and that's going to definitely affect um, what you can shoot. And if you getting as close as you can to a light, that also uh, definitely helps you to be able to um, 
get the best exposures. These uh, portable cameras don't have the best sensors in the world in them, especially when it comes to um, when it comes to low light situations. So when you have a digital SLR film camera, you can get away with uh, doing things in the dark. In fact, you can just leave the shutter open longer and use uh, reciprocity failure, which is uh, sort of this idea that even bright lights at night will take longer to burn into the, to the chip uh, or into the film. You can use that to your advantage to do uh, night photography. You can't do that with these smaller chips as easily because they just they don't handle very well in uh, a low light situation. And that's kind of the way these GoPros work too. So you can see this GoPro, when it's rear lit like this, um, you know, it doesn't do, it's not doing um, very good color balancing. So everything looks a little orange, a little kind of nasty. So really just by changing around where the camera is placed, you know, if you've got the light generally behind you more or to the side of you, uh, it's gonna it's gonna help the quality um, of of the the final final photo. When you have light behind you, it's just naturally going to uh, the auto the auto uh, exposure that the camera is sort of built to do on its own. At least, especially on cheaper cameras or on phones where you don't have manual controls, it's going to try to average things out. Since there is such a strong light source there, it's going to try to bring that down so that 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 bright white from the the you know the light that's directly in the shot it's going to try to get that to be like more of a neutral gray and in doing so it's going to make the things in the foreground really really dark so you don't want that either okay so moving on if we're looking back at this view and I'm going to disconnect this light so you see there's a lot more light on this side of my face and if I get this light even closer to me let's see if I can do that successfully now I have a really strong uh, bright light on the side of me here, right? If uh, and this is a common technique you'll see photographers do with their using natural light, is that they'll get one of these guys, and you know they might have an even bigger one. What this guy is, this is the fun part, is a little uh, bounce card or um, reflector. You'll see that there's a white side and there's this sort of goldish pattern if you can see the pattern so much uh, but it's very a lot more reflective on this side and what you do with something like this is you get it on the opposite side of the light source um, and you get it essentially the opposite side of the light source to the subject that you're shooting so what you're essentially doing is taking if we get even closer so that essentially have this card like right so before I had this, right, my face is much darker on this side, and bear with me some, this camera is auto-correcting um, the light in the space, so you don't get to see this as much. But as you bring this card in, you can even see it on my shirt. Just those subtle differences in bringing up a little bit of light, if you, if you ever watch those old black and white movies, this is, there would be a guy off stage that would have a little park cam light, a little tiny light, and it would be shooting not even on the set anywhere. It would be like shooting off somewhere else. And there'd be a guy with one of these that would just bounce that. That light would be very direct and very over contrasty. It would just be really super bright. And you don't want to shoot that on your subject directly necessarily, but if you have a little bounce card like this, it's going to allow you to just bounce just a little bit of that light back see so this is with the white side so without and with you can see it's just giving a little bit more of a full uh, set of light around the subject right so that can be uh, really handy to have one of these and this these are really cheap especially the small ones it's super portable and you just kind of twist it back up into its small small little uh, configuration throw it right back in the bag um, so super handy to have. I've been wanting one of these for years. I just bought this one a couple weeks ago, actually. So that you can um, have in your, you can just have this in your laptop bag or in your backpack or whatever. 
Uh, you know, you need to have a camera for that if you have your camera phone. It can be a very handy way, especially like if you're outside in the sun. You have very strong sunlight. It's causing like a lot of, a lot of contrast beside one side of the subject and the other. Just pull that out, bounce a little of that back. You do the same thing with white paper, same thing. And in fact, that leads me to my next thing, which is if you have a flash available, and even if it's uh, with your digital camera, you can digital cam or with your um, camera phone. Camera phone uh, photos can be slow enough that if you're in a dark enough place, it might take a half a second for that photo to take. If you shoot a bright flash in that half second, that's definitely going to be the brightest thing that it sees. So you can use a flash, and you can hear it powering up. These are two different flashes here. They are both also slave flashes. So what that means is that if you set these to be slave flash on, then um, when you shoot one, uh, if there's any bright light change that the sensor on the slave flash recognizes, and you can see the sensor for this guy is right here, the sensor for this guy is right here, if uh, one of these goes off essentially, or if the flash on your camera goes off, then these guys will also trigger. So you can get the combinatorial effect, even if wirelessly across the space, you can um, still get one of these triggered. And I don't actually know if this will work, if you'll be able to see this in the camera because it's so fast. But I'm gonna give it a shot. So if I trigger this guy, it will also trigger this guy. And you probably can't see that because it's like one frame, but just uh, believe me, let's say that. So uh, this Lumo Pro, great, great flash, uh, really cheap for what it is. Uh, gives you a swivel head. Uh, it also allows you to zoom the flash, so you can get a wider zoom or a tighter zoom, depending on what you're doing. And when I use a flash, I don't, I don't hardly ever aim it at the subject. What I'll do is essentially use like the ceiling uh, as a bounce card, right? So this flash is a lot brighter than a typical light source. Uh, it's just shooting that huge amount of light in a very split second uh, versus a continual light source. So if you aim it at the ceiling and you stop down your camera somehow to be able to appropriately uh, register that extra amount of light, then it will shoot that light up onto the ceiling very directly, but when it hits the ceiling, it's gonna just spread it all over the place because of all the texture from the ceiling. And you can get some really nice shots in low light situations that way. Without, a, you know, if you have this guy right next to your lens, then the subject that you're hitting is just washing it all out like when we had uh, the light source behind. So, keep that in mind. Um, I will turn this off because it's making a horrible buzzing noise. So, uh, very handy to have a flash, or a slave also, because you can have sort of a slave off to the side, bouncing at the ceiling, and it can give you a little bit of extra bounce light also. The one last thing I'll say about that is if you want to manually trigger a slave flash, but you don't want your main trigger to uh, generate any light, what you can do is um, you can get these polyester filters. Uh, they're number 87 filters, if you... Uh, if you ever need to find these online. Um, and that's just kind of a, it's a, a specification for uh, the, the material properties of this. And if you look at this in the camera, it's not actually gonna look like any light can go through because visible light effectively does not go through this. Maybe a tiny bit of visible light goes through this. But what you can do is you can buy these, you can cut off a little sliver and put it over a flash you can even put it over um, a, a set of infrared LEDs or um, something that can generate a infrared light source uh, rather quickly. Since these slave flashes are triggered by a, um, a very sudden change in the amount of infrared light in the space, there's an infrared sensor here. Infrared light naturally comes out of tungsten and other sorts of flash uh, light automatically. So. Um, of course, a visible light flash will trigger uh, the sensor, the infrared sensor, but if you just have infrared source or if you filter down a visible light source to infrared, which is what this does, it effectively blocks the visible light and lets uh, the rest of the infrared spectrum through. If you do that, then you'll essentially be able to trigger these guys uh, remotely 
without any vi without any visible light uh, trigger. So you could have the flash on your camera uh, essentially trigger these guys. Um, to be honest, I have not actually tried that with the iPhone. Uh, I need to try that sometime. Um, I don't know if that's a bright enough light source or not. It might be, it might not be. I have a feeling that it would be, but um, I don't know if we can try it in here because I'd have to turn off all the lights and there's other people working in here. So, um, I think that's about it for today. Um, those are a few different um, things that you can add to your arsenal. Most of them are pretty small. They don't require you to um, to uh, have any additional heavy things on you. Um, I did want to mention also, just got this other day, and it's very handy for all of the things we've been talking about. This is a little Techion, not a Techion ray gun, unfortunately, but this is the name of the company. This is a little battery charger, uh, and what's nice about this is you can put your uh, AA rechargeable batteries in here, and um, plug a 5 volt, you know, USB, this is just a standard USB, or USB connection, which you could plug into your computer directly. Uh, you could also plug it in with an iPhone charger or any standard USB 5 volt charger, which there's thousands and thousands of different ones out there now. Um, you can plug that in, recharge for double A's here, which is pretty standard four batteries, what you need in a flash. So you could effectively be powering or you know charging up the batteries for your flash if you had a flash on you, very handy. The other thing you can do with this is it also has a standard USB out, which you can then take to um, keep uh, various other USB devices uh, hot and ready to go. So if you wanted to use the GoPro out in the field, if you didn't have this battery pack, uh, you know, there's a standard USB port on the side. Even if you are using the battery pack, there's a, another USB port on the back. So if you just wanted to bolster this even more, keep it on even longer, then uh, there you go. You got this guy. Um, of course, you could also power your iPhone longer if you wanted your iPhone connected, uh, you know, to uh, using the uh, Glyph. You know, have it connected to a tripod, have it taking pictures. Uh, if you're writing apps, you could have it take a photo every few seconds or whatever, uh, and you know, be off and running. This will help uh, keep it going longer if you're out in the field and don't have a power source. Um, so that is kind of the last little bit I've got for today. Um, looks like there's a couple people in chat. Was there any questions or any? additional um, things I could add before I close. Pretty self-explanatory day today. Um, but yeah, I encourage you to play around a bit. Um, looks like no questions for today. So uh, I'm going to end there and um, I have to go run some errands. So this is a good time to stop. Um, if you have any other questions about this, feel free to post them to the blog or post them to Variable Res uh, at Twitter. Um, also, feel free to go to variableresistance.org and take a look there. I'll have this up uh, on the archive shortly. So, thank you for tuning in and uh, have a good week. Thanks. Oh, overlay. Overlay. Oh, my overlay is not working. See you next week.